Hi friends, my name is Derek, and I would like to talk with you today about attributes versus approaches. And this is basically a way to distinguish between two fundamental frames of reference by which individuals might understand personality or people and how they are the same to each other or different from each other, etc. And how we can kind of, at the very least, taxonomy those different kinds of people into groups, whether you can see it's accurate or not to do so, whether it's worthwhile or not to do so, is another question, but it, it certainly is possible. So hopefully this video will elucidate why some ways of doing that are better than others and more meaningful. So let's begin with an idea of addressing this attributes versus approaches issue in the world. So let's start with the attributes, and the example is going to be tree height. So you could imagine <clears throat> discussing the tallness of a tree, the height of a tree, as it relates to width. And there would be a fairly weak correlation there. So there are some extremely tall palm trees that are not nearly as thick at their thickest point or as wide at their thickest point as, say, the tree you're looking at right here in the background, which is from my backyard. Um, so those two... There, there's a, a linkage there that, in other words, typically, whatever kind of tree you are, the taller you get, the wider you get. But there's not a linkage but among trees in general. So I could have a squat tree that's very wide or a very tall tree that's not very wide. We also have tall short. Now, in this regard, to the extent a tree is tall, it is not short. To the extent, extent a tree is short, it is not tall. These are inversely proportional attributes. And that's a different relationship between the attributes than between tall and wide, right? Okay, we have tall heavy. Tall and heavy are like tall and wide. It's the same kind of thing. I, I forgot that I had put, I guess I put two examples of the same thing. Tall and birth date. So let's say um, each of these trees uh, was was born from seed in a nursery in one of the 50 states. And all the nurseries have the same supply of different seeds, let's say. Well, then, it's unrelated. You might be able to find a correlation in the data because, for example, let's say the gardeners in the nurseries in Rhode Island do an especially good job or have especially robust seeds, and so there aren't very many of them, so the totality of their trees coming out of there from those seeds statistically as just an anomalous reality or whatever, um, are larger consistently to a statistically significant degree than trees from other states or whatever. But that wouldn't be linked to the state. It, it, would, it would be a mis mistake to say that, therefore, if I grow trees in Rhode Island, my trees will be taller than if I grow them in some other state. So that would be a misleading link there, right? Even if the data supports it. Tall gender. Well, this is more of a person thing, right? But pretend we're talking about people for a second. It is true that in general, men are taller than women. But um, all that allows us to do is to say, is this woman tall compared to other women? And have a more meaningful status afforded of her as tall or not than if we compare her against both men and women, in which case her tallness as a woman will be lost in the mix and she'll be seen as more average height. Tall mood. How tall I am is completely unlinked to my mood entirely. So, and it's not even like birth date. Birth date might mislead you, but nobody's going to think that my mood changes my height. Tall enough or too tall. So in this frame of reference, we start getting into, instead of attributes, approaches a little bit. We say, okay, well, let's measure this issue of tallness relative to something. Is this tree tall enough to provide a safe nesting spot for this species of bird? Or is it too short such that cats will climb up and get to its babies? Is a question that, that establishes the way that in which tall enough or too tall requires us to set the frame in a way that these other things don't. The other things have implicit frames, though. If I'm just talking about how tall a tree is, implicitly I'm saying against the norm. Well, that's a really tall tree. Means it's taller than most of the other trees I see. 
even though we never state that, that frame explicitly. Taller than, shorter than, same thing as tall enough or too tall, except in the second la in the second instance, we don't have to link to a specific purpose, but rather another object. Okay, so these are different ways that we can deal with attributes, basically, not, not so much approaches. Some of them are informative about approaches, such as, is it tall enough for my purpose or short, too short for my purpose is sort of informative about approaches, but it's still treating it as something that's static as an attribute that may or may not be linked to some other attribute. Now in big five, we have, we have to first begin before exploring big five. Note that the big five is called ocean, which is, uh, it measures your openness, your conscientiousness, your extroversion, your agreeableness and your neuroticism. Okay. It treats each of these things as though they were of the tall mood variety up there, which is to say that they are unlinked to each other and yet they can be measured totally separately. You can measure my height and you can measure my mood. And the, the measurements of one will never impact the measurements of another. Now, in contrast, of course, if you think about something like a teeter-totter, if you push one end down, the other end goes up, right? Well, so when we're talking about Big Five, we're talking about instances. If you're going to describe me as, say, conscientious, you're going to idea, presumably have instances to point to, a repetition of instances to point to. But that's not the same thing as saying, right now you're being conscientious, in which case would be an instance unfolding that you're analyzing, right? Let me analyze this guy's behavior right now. Oh, look, he's being conscientious. If I'm, say, an observer with a lab coat and a clipboard. Okay, let's go down here. Repetition. So repetition of instances, a bunch of repetition of instances, the person with the lab coat and the clipboard's going to write down, check conscientious. I've observed him for two weeks, and I've seen him uh, do this many different things that represent instances of following through on previous commitments of some sort. These things qualify as conscientious, therefore he's conscientious, okay? Of course, the Big Five doesn't take that approach of observing people's behaviors, but if it did, that would be the way to approach them, right? Now, if you have identity maps, um, this is what you're trying to get, which is just, uh, I want to have a list of accurate descriptors of this person's personality. And I can do that by playing that lab coat guy. Of course, that's not, that's not feasible in terms of, of actually implementing the test. I can't get a bunch of scientists to go around and, and observe individuals and do direct measurements like that to determine whether or not they qualify as conscientious, open, agreeable, etc. Um, there's another approach would be indirect measurements. So if instead of asking you whether or not you are conscientious, I ask you things like, how important do you think it is for a person to, is it more important to follow through on what they say they're going to do or should they seize upon a better opportunity if it arises or something? That will tell you their attitude towards the world's demonstrations on this, this vector. And one might presume or assume, one might reasonably conclude that there's a linkage to their own self-perception, that people aren't going to hate things that remind them of the things that they're good at. They're going to acknowledge the validity of those things, and they're going to oppose things that would seem to invalidate them. It's not an unreasonable conclusion to draw, although it's probably not adequately supported to base any particular strong conclusions on. There's also self-reporting. Well, you just tell me, are you how conscientious are you? Maybe I could be more specific than that. Or can you think of instances in which you've been scolded for forgetting about things, you know, you could try to make it more factual like that. Then there are process maps. Now process maps, um, will, will map how you are likely to approach a given question rather than what your likely answer to it is going to be. So, an example I've talked about in a video before, or we've talked about it a couple times before, is a conversation I had with an ESTP woman who indicated to me that she was questioning whether she was really an ESP because she didn't like John Wick. And it would seem, if you read the type descriptions, 
that John Wick is exactly the sort of movie that an ESTP would probably like. It's right up their alley, right? Well, the point is, that's using an ID map and saying, if we look at multiple instances of of somebody who really likes man, 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 it's using an ID map in direct measurement. That if I'm if I'm really good at physicality and and kicking ass and being decisive and being opportunistic and all these sort of things that typically are associated with the STP, then surely I'm going to like movies like that. So it's one of those indirect measurements and it's an ID map. But of course, to understand a person's type properly, in my opinion, is to reject that approach in favor of the alternate approach, which is, okay, if you're an ESTP and you don't like John Wick, what are your reasons going to be as to why? So, in order to to see why that's so much more determinant, we have to understand the difference between mechanisms versus descriptors. So, Big Five doesn't purport to provide any mechanisms. It doesn't explain why somebody is conscientious, why somebody is agreeable, why somebody is neurotic, or whatnot. Um, in other words, it it says that's left to the the particularist level to solve. To the extent that you are a particular set of these attributes it probably stems from your particular experience and if you're not scoring well on the good ones and you're scoring high on the bad ones like neuroticism is not considered a good trait generally um, conscientiousness is considered a good one if you score low on conscientiousness and high on neuroticism they're basically saying your particular experience has made it such that you can't be as good at personality as somebody else which is a weird thing to say, right? <laughs> <clears throat> but that's because Big Five purports to describe that which it does not explain. Okay, which part stays put is really the issue. What I mean by that is if I'm, if I'm saying, okay, well, why do you not like John Wick? And you are telling me I don't like it because it didn't have enough um, intellectual discussion or ideas exchanged. It was too banal. There wasn't enough meaningful engagement emotionally or or uh, creatively or it it was just stuff, the basic concept I got in a second and I was done with, with there wasn't much more to it. It's just this guy goes around he's really good at killing people and kills a bunch of people. Okay, so that would be one way of critiquing it, right? But that would not be an ESTP's way of critiquing it. Like, so the ESP critiqued it by saying, basically, she found it unacceptable that he was this total badass for the whole movie, except for this one scene where they kill his dog and beat him up, at which point he's just totally passive and weak. And she was basically saying, I, I just don't buy that. That doesn't make sense. Why this person would not carry this same quality through all the way and would just have this momentary brief period where they're a totally different person doesn't make any sense. So that's, that would be representative of what we would call in cognitive functions, introverted sensing as an absolute value, that your experience in your past continues on forward and expresses as part of who you are, that if, in fact, you, you think you can, you can reinvent yourself and become a brand new person with, well, by just sort of discarding your previous endeavors as though they informed nobody about anything regarding you, that that's somehow offensive. Now, it, and then another criticism she had of the movie was that it was unrealistic that he would have to get so lucky to miss all the, to get missed by all those bullets and stuff. Again, that's a critique about the realities in physical space of attempting to do what he's doing. So, as an expert on doing things, an ESTP is going to critique about doing things. As somebody who has an absolute value, the capacity to be opportunistic and pull the trigger and execute shit, and also, as an absolute value, the continuity of what's come before, and, you know, to, in order to follow through on anything, you have to remember what you plan to do and stick with that plan. So, you know, these critiques she's making are absolutely consistent with SE and SI's absolute value. What do I mean by an absolute value? I mean an end in itself. It's not something you use for some other purpose. So... It's necessarily the case that my extroverted intuition, which is generating all these words right now, as I'm explaining these concepts that I laid out on this agenda ahead of time, is, 
is purposeful for something. Namely, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get people to agree with me and or enjoy watching my videos and or find them useful in some fashion that presumably makes me successful at YouTube. But that presumably makes me successful at YouTube is obviously not an absolute value for me. If it were an absolute value for me, I know very well how to make my channel much more successful. I can make a bunch of short videos that offer generalities that feel like they're saying something important and offer a bunch of praise to a given type in about three minutes, two minutes or whatever, and just upload those every day and I'd be huge. I'm sure I would if I just told people how great they were all the time. <laughs> people love to hear how great their type is. You are the Sigma INFJ. Here's 15 reasons why you're the most mystical, magical, wonderful, extremely fantastic type ever. And people just eat that shit up. So obviously it must not be an absolute value for me, right? Um, but the extroverted intuition is an absolute value. So in other words, I continue to, to, can, to say all of these things, even though that's not the best way to achieve success by any conventional metric. I do want to be liked, though, so I'm continuing to try to improve my delivery such that it's not so condescending, I'm not seen so arrogant, I'm just not seen as a dick or an asshole. That's inclusive and inviting. I want you to be part of this correct thing and to have some ownership over it as well um, so that it's, I, can, I, can, I can be heard more by people and less, and, so I can pass their first test. So for a lot of people, they have a you know sort of a first test as to whether you're worth even checking out or listening to at all. And if I don't pass that, and a lot of times it'll be some sort of F thing, like either F E or F I. This guy thinks he's so good, is or thinks he's so smart, is a turn off, and then people don't want to watch it. Or this guy's being too big wordy. It's gonna be too much intellectual work to watch this. I don't even want. To, I don't care. You know. So the thing is. Um, this informs us about absolute values and instrumental values. It's absolutely valuable to me to be able to talk things out. It's absolutely valuable for me to be liked and appreciated by other people. It has to be logical in order for me to accomplish that, but if I'm doing something logical, but I'm perfectly just as happy getting appreciation, praise, affirmation for uh, humor things or music as I am for logical things. So my tool function is just instrumental. It's just there to get me... Uh, uh, so that my ideas that I'm saying are going to validate on some level so that some of the people at least are going to go, okay, that sounds right. You sound like you got it down. Good job, Eric. We like you. We approve of your correctness. Okay, so typology differs then in that it's a frames-first approach. It says, if it's, if it's understood correctly by my understanding, okay, it's a frames-first approach in that it says, Whatever we want to call extroverted thinking or extroverted sensing or introverted th sensing or introverted intuition or whatever, we can't meaningfully call it anything without linking it to something else that marks the other pole of it. So as a consequence, we're, we've decided, you know, we've, we've addressed first in typology what they, they fail to address in Big Five, which is what kind of attribute slash, um, slash approach are we dealing with here? If Big Five assumes every personality trait is like height and mood, then, then you know that's fine for them to assume that. But there's absolutely no reason to think that something like openness doesn't have a more complex relationship with something like uh, conscientiousness than simply the relationship between height and mood. Big the Big Five doesn't address the frame question regardless. Okay, you won't hear anybody in Big Five discussing what I'm talking about right here. So typology includes reality of descriptions articulated in one. That's what I just said. It's like our, it takes into account the fact that there are different kinds of relationships between attributes that we might describe. And I'll give you an example from the real world about what happens when people don't think about the framings of things. So we know that climate change is real and we know that it's anthropogenic, which is to say it's caused by humans, uh, namely by the putting of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But what's continually assumed by everybody because they, there's not there's not the adequate discussion of the framing is that they know what the curve of carbon dioxide to warming is so there's a presumption in almost all conversations about climate change that it's just a straight line like this okay or i mean from your angle it would be like like i can't it's backwards on the tv i can't make it go like that but you know what i'm saying um 
but it could be uh, accelerating the runhouse greenhouse greenhouse effect, or it could be diminishing returns. Now, I've never heard any discussion in public discourse about climate change regarding what that curve of carbon dioxide warming actually is. We know from plenty of things in the world that things, the, the impact of a given element upon a system has can be mathematically graphed in different kinds of curves. And yet everybody's talking about what ought to be done regarding carbon without first addressing the frame that would allow us to meaningfully answer that question. So if it is runaway greenhouse, there's a much greater impetus to take measures to try to reduce carbon emissions than if it's a diminishing returns thing. And if it's a, if it's a straight line, then you know, we can make, make, make discussions about how much energy to put into sequestration techniques and or whether a black swan is going to come and save the day and we're just wasting our time, whether we should, we should put energies into adaptation or mitigation, what the actual impacts of a carbon tax or a carbon cap would be, whether that would just simply displace manufacturing to more dirty manufacturers in China, India, Brazil, Russia, etc. We can just have all of those discussions then and have them mean something. But prior to actually arguing the framing issue and determining that, our discussions are all operating under an assumed and, and not explicit frame. And as a consequence, it means people aren't being intelligent about the matter. Because, you know, you can't intelligently talk about it until that question's answered. So, the thing about typology is it acknowledges in its analysis of the processes it it explains, it acknowledges that people express themselves as agents, that is to say, they framing through the lens of, if I'm framing through the lens of SE, and I'm complaining about John Wick, if I'm framing through that lens, I'm going to complain about things like, how could he not get hit by those bullets? If I'm framing through the lens of extroverted intuition, I might complain, there's no, there's no new ideas in here, okay? Um, and, and that's, uh, that's just, it sort of ex explains when we critique and don't make our frames explicit, what, what implicit frames are we critiquing from? It also acknowledges, though, that publicly engaging by the, the tools of something, acting as a subject with something, is a different process. So right now, I'm explaining things in ways that don't contradict themselves and make good logical sense. And I'm linking to concrete examples in the real world in hopes that it becomes more clear for everybody and all that kind of stuff. This is me using TI to make a sustainable um, case explaining my position on these things that is not subject to legitimate critique as far as I can tell. Now, some legitimate critiques might come in after I'm done with it and say, no, you didn't account for me on me and this is a TI problem. But I'm nevertheless using TI as a subject. If that were to happen, then I'd be shifting into using it as an object. Okay, they're right, I need to change this. Or not doing so well <laughs> reacting to it as an object. No, no, I don't care what you say, nanny, 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 is another possible response to it, right? So here's, here's an, another example, like the ESP question. Why didn't I like, there's something about Mary. I agree that it was a pretty funny movie. This is an old movie, but... Um, Basically, it's not the kind of movie I can watch because it gets a lot of its humor through cringy moments. And for me, Effie is an absolute value. So the the cringe is absolutely bad. And whether or not it produces humor, well, that's irrelevant because it doesn't, it doesn't jump the first criterion. I find the cringiness uh, painful and it, viola it doesn't uphold that fundamental value, so it's too uncomfortable for me to watch the movie, even if I were to acknowledge its goodness on some level. Takeaway. How, when, and why we communicate our justifications tells us much more about a person's total cognition than behavior ever could. So when I'm typing somebody, I might start with a question like, well, um... Do you eat, how many do you eat regularly three meals a day? And they might go, Yep, right on point, three meals a day. It's critical that I ask why. <laughs> if their answer is, well, because mom always puts food in front of me, it's a very different conclusion or takeaway from that than if the answer is because 
I prep out my meals in advance every the night before and have them all set out and know exactly what I'm going to eat. You know, one's indicative of strong SI and one's not. The, the latter is indicative of stronger SI than the former, right? Um, <clears throat> similarly, with, with somebody's, somebody's work, it's not just communications, it's work. So I have a lot of, I've had several arguments with people, and I won't have these arguments anymore, about what type uh, Eminem is. So if you look at his affect in interviews, if you see how he carries himself and the way that he is not particularly expansive in his responses to questions and stuff, you are well justified in concluding that guy's an ISTP. But in that case, what you're doing is you're doing direct measurements. You're observing his behavior and directly measuring it and then linking it to an ID map. But the thing is, it's a better way to type him, to judge him by his work than his interviews because it's very conceivable that Eminem has cultivated a certain character he plays in an interview that maximally attains outcomes on a career level while concurrently being an ENTP. But it's not possible, from my understanding of things, for him to do all the work that he did and concurrently be an ISTP. So, from my perspective, his communicative output is much more revelatory about what type he is than any instance of behavior that we can actually watch and measure directly. In this instance, what most people would say is more scientific or more empiric because you're just focusing on the affect, the things that everybody can look at, pieces of objective data, the interview of him. Um, it's ignoring the fact that you're just looking at him as a subject, taking an action that he knows is public for the purpose of, of impacting public impression about him, as opposed to how he normally acts like a subject in terms of his actual work rather than talking about his work is very much ideationally robust. He's got words coming out of his every orifice, you know, and also in terms of how he frames the world in, with his lenses. Uh, he's, he's continually juxtaposing himself against, uh, against certain norms and, and basically, always getting ahead of it. So if you, see, I know he didn't write the script for Eight Mile or anything, but if you see the end part of Eight Mile, at the very end when he's going to go up against this last rapper, he goes first. And what he does is he raps all the things the next guy is going to say about him. In other words, he gets out ahead of it and ideates out all the possible attacks that the other person can can make, and then the other person can't get up there and do anything without just copying Eminem. So, like. That right there, that, that thing I just described, is a textbook, textbook ENTP thing to do. And it's possible that Eminem is a highly motivated INTP, I suppose, but he's got to be one or the other. He's, and I, I would say he's definitely FI polar, as is indicated by his long time putting up of abuse by that horrible woman that he was with, while concurrently making songs about how he wants to kill her, uh, and not quite getting that maybe that means he should break up with her. Uh, you know, it's like those things, there's a lot of indications that would suggest to me that he's he's an ENTP. But those justifications that I'm using are are sort of process maps. They're saying, look, this is how the processes work. So if you were to, if I, if I can show you work product that requires you to have a robust relationship with this end of this pole and a weak relationship with this end of the pole, then... Um, then that's going to be determinate because those high, the top ends of those poles tend to link to some kind of skills thing. Not all of them link to so testable a skills, but a lot of them do. So, uh, you know, in order to generate as many words as I'm generating here with this little outline uh, and do so so fluidly and hopefully clearly requires me to have a, a good, strong relationship with extroverted intuition. To continue to really do this for years and years and years, uh, on this channel is very strong indication that I am an extroverted intuitor. That in fact, these multiple repeating instances of me displaying the skills that strongly linked to being at one end of the pole rather than the other are in fact representative of a relationship with that pole, that polar pole, you know, that pole. Um, and the one end of it and the other end of it um, are necessarily definitionally, obviously unavoidably related to one another. Such that 
instead of always repeating the same day over and over again. In other words, well, you know, it's my it's my Tuesday. On Tuesdays, I have this, then I do this, and I go to my class, then I go to my house, and then I come back home. And all. Instead of having that kind of life, I've got a life where I had no idea what I was going to do today, except I got the first shot of my COVID vaccination, which I got to get because like, they won't let me go see my mom unless I get vaccinated. So I, I knew I was going to do that. For the rest of the day, I, I had no idea what I was going to do today. And I still don't. And I told Rachel, I think I'm going to make a video after we got back. She said, I think I'm going to go lie down. And um, I started a video that was less laid out than this. You just had three things. And it turned into a sloppy mess. And I realized I was trying to split the difference between two different kinds of concepts I had at the same time. And, and I ended up starting over redoing the notepad document and ending up with this video here. So it's like... It, what's Big Five going to call me? If, it, now, now when we ask this question, after having done that analysis of myself, of other pe people and the way they justify things and m and m and everything, what's, what's the Big Five going to tell, tell us about me? Am I conscientious because once again I'm making another video? Am I um, not very open because I'm just making another video and I did that yesterday too? And it's the same thing. Um, am I... Not very agreeable because this video is about explaining things rather than um, praising people? Or am I very agreeable because I'm trying to present it in a way that it invites you to, to join me in understanding this? I, you know, a am, I, am I open because I'm explaining some concepts that, that bring, shed a new light onto existing paradigms in ways that people often haven't thought of before? Or am I very closed because I'm insisting that one is better than the other? These kind of questions can't really be answered if you view people as having attributes that are independent of each other, like height and mood. Because that's not how people are. My conscientiousness is linked to my ideational freshness in ways that are unavoidably so. To the extent that I'm making this video right now because it felt like something I wanted to explain. It seems like a pretty good video idea. means I'm not getting new trash bags for the trash cans, which after I took the trash out, forgot to grab bags on the way back. You know, it means I'm not cleaning this filthy kitchen floor that I need to clean. And it means I'm not filling out the tax paperwork because I got a couple weeks until the due date, so I'm like dragging my feet on it, you know. All of these things go hand in hand. So depending on your frame of reference and what's important, I'm either very conscientious, I'm applying myself to what matters, explaining these important things, or I'm very not conscientious. I'm not applying myself to what matters, cleaning and tax documents. Um, that's the problem with Big Five. And the biggest problem, of course, of all, is there's never been this discussion among psychologists regarding the Big Five model. There's not people out there saying, okay, if we're going to approach it like this, let's at least contextualize it within a frame of possible approaches and understand it's both limitations and advantages. To, to narrow the scope of claims we make about what it means so that it's not completely arbitrary nonsense bullshit. Um, I don't think they're having those discussions at all, but I'm having it here, and I hopefully you liked it, this video. And if you did like this video, please like it with your thumbs up. And if you don't want to, that's fine. And if you really want to subscribe to me, that would be great too, but most people don't do that, I guess. So, um, I, I rarely subscribe to anybody. It's like, <laughs> you know, even if I really like a channel a lot, I don't subscribe to it because I'm, you know, there's this, this one channel called, I forget what it's called, but it does things like 10 spookiest things found on the internet or whatever. And I probably have watched every video they've made. But I still don't subscribe to it because what do I care? It's like I'm not waiting for your new videos. I'm it, whatever I'm searching YouTube for at the moment, or just sort of chasing along this recommended video trail or whatever. I, I'm not interested in subscribing to your channel. I've subscribed to Gen Xial, Gen Zenial. Sorry, Gen Xial. Don't have an X in your name if you don't want to be called Gen Xial. Anyway, Gen Xenial actually. Gen Gen Xenial. Because uh, he live streams sometimes, and I'd like to catch his live streams. I rarely do, but when I do, it's kind of fun to be in the chat. And there's a couple other people I subscribe to, but um, not for any purpose other than I 
I like them or something like I want to I want to give my vote of confidence to them rather than because I want notifications or something. <laughs> Anywho, a little bit of random nonsense there at the end. Sorry to muddy the waters with, with Eric's personal anecdote. But there you have it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheese. And I hope you found this informative and you agree with it. And if you don't, that's okay too. But don't. But try to be responsive and what you don't like about it instead of just shitting on me completely for broad and unspecified reasons.